Welcome to the Diversity in the STEM Scholars Series, sponsored by the HHMI-funded UHD Synergy IE program. My name is Yuan Yuan Kang, and I'm Assistant Professor at the Natural Science Department and your host today. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to give you an outline of today's format. We'll start with a presentation, followed by a short Q&A session. If you have any questions for the speaker, please enter them using the Q&A function. At 12.50, we have a 25-minute discussion session for students only, when all faculty leave and the students have the opportunities to converse freely with the speaker. Today's speaker is Dr. Caroline Palavacino Maggio. She's a research fellow in the Department of Neurobiology at Harvard Medical School in the laboratory of Dr. Ed Krivitz. Caroline earned her PhD with honors from Rutgers University and the New Jersey Medical School and her BS degree from Ryder College. Dr. Maggio has been selected for many awards. This include the NIH Independent Dissertation Research R36 grant to carry out her PhD thesis work on intentional neutron transports and the dopamine receptors as well as several prestigious awards from the Rutgers Society Foundation, New York Academy of Sciences, and the Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellowship. Last year, she was acknowledged by Cell Press in their 100 Most Inspiring Hispanic Latinx Scientists in America list. Dr. Maggio is also a strong advocate for social justice and encouraging young people from underrepresented backgrounds to pursue STEM careers. Her research aims to elucidate the neuron circuits that governs female aggression. Caroline looks forward to eventually beginning an independent research uh, group after completing her postdoc training and sharing her passion to investigate the female aggression. Without further ado, here I present today's speaker, Dr. Karen Lai Maggio. Thank you, Dr. Khan. Let me share my screen. Okay. Can you see my, my slide? Yes. Okay. Okay. So thank you so much, Dr. Kim, for this um, amazing introduction. I also want to thank um, others from the leadership committee for inviting me here today. It is really an honor to be here. I also want to thank Cleo for organizing today's event. And I'm really excited to share with you my scientific journey and how it led me to one of the most significant research findings in my career of, of female aggression. So just to give you a, a piece of um, a background. So my dad um, is actually from Chile. He immigrated from Chile uh, during the 1970s when Pinochet took over. And this is my dad um, with $10 to his name on his way. And that was just his only little uh, briefcase on his way to the US. And this is uh, my grandma. Uh, so she actually uh, passed away um, in 1993, but she was uh, part of um, um, an indigenous um, tribe called Mapuches. And they, it, what's interesting is that growing up, uh, my dad, you know, would have these um, really interesting words that my, my siblings and I thought were very funny. But later, they, we learned that this is actually part of their dialect. And then, uh, so this is my mom. So she is from Colombia. She's from Santa Marta, Colombia, the coastal region. And she also immigrated um, from Colombia around the same time. Um, and this was just due to like a lot of uh, the warfare that was going on in Colombia. It was just easy. It was just not easy to uh, hold a job and also, you know, provide for your family. So she came to the U.S. as well. And I was born in 1981, and we lived on 139th Street in Harlem. And later we moved um, up to Washington Heights. And growing up, um, so this is a meme that really re uh, resonates a lot with me because growing up uh, with my parents, you know, they don't speak English. And so, you know, you're really subjected to uh, being the, this liaison between the American society and your, and your folks. 
And so you have to most of the time either translate um, these legal documents for them, help them make uh, doctor appointments, or sometimes you know you have to uh, even advocate for them um, from you know either the light bill was too high and they think that they're you know they're they're being um, that somebody's trying to steal their money. So they're there yelling at you, even though you're just the messenger, and then you have to go back and, and have, you know, and, and speak with, with the companies and so forth to, to sort of, you know, make their argument. Uh, so that, that was, you know, and so on top of your schooling, you also have this other added um, burden. So growing up in Washington Heights was, you know, a lot of fun. This is um, 187th Street. We had a lot of um, different, so, you know, maybe some people when they go for summer, their summer home is maybe in a lake house. Uh, so my summers were actually outside um, what we call the bompa is where we used to open up the fire hydrant and just, that would be our, our the, the quote unquote, like the pool, the sprinkler system. Um, and, or we would play a handball or double dutch. And then most, and I remember there's this one Mr. Softy song uh, that we would know when the ice cream truck would come around. And then later do we come to find out that actually that ice cream truck sometimes sold uh, drugs in the back. Um, but so we lived in a uh, very small apartment. Um, this was our beds in the back. My brother slept on one side of the living room and my sister and I slept on the other side. So we were very uh, tight knit in not, not just in closeness, but in, in physical proximity, but also um, sharing, like we were always doing things together with my extended family, my cousins, my aunts, my grandmother. So we were always, um, you know, when, when people say, okay, when your family comes over, it's not just my parents and me, it's like my parents, my uncle, my cousins, everyone um, comes with, 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 with that. that. That's how, or if not, you, they'll get offended. Um, so, and as you all know, I'm not sure you guys are aware, but in New York City, there's this creature here, <laughs> this insect called a cockroach. And so this is sort of, you know, inevitable when you live um, in New York in the building, especially um, in the 80s when I grew up. And so one of the things that fascinated me about this was that at night when my sister, I remember my older sister, my brother would turn on the lights that you can see the, the cockroaches like, you know, spreading, like they were sort of like spread everywhere. Um, some of them would know to go into crevices. Some of them would know to uh, either go in other packs with other groups of cockroaches. So that behavior, that change in behavior always intrigued me. And I remember my siblings always telling me like, Caroline, you're so weird. How, why would you even want to, you know, want to look at it? Normally people would just want to squish them or kill them. But I was just really intrigued. Like I, I would ask questions like, well, how do they know to go into the crevice? Like, how do they know that the light is on? Um, what sort of sensors do they have? So these are the type of questions that sparked me, you know, growing up. I just didn't know that, you know, later I came to know that that's actually, you know, science, but I, I didn't know that those were the type of questions that research asked. Um, then unfortunately, uh, when I was 13, my older sister, um, she actually, she committed suicide. So that, that, that uh, experience really, um, like, um, it really hit me hard because of the closeness of that I had with my sister, we would share everything. And then when this happened, it was a, a really big hit for me because I didn't understand how this came to be because she didn't have any type of these, uh, you know, tendencies or anything like that. It was just one day to the next. So when I went to, um, so just to, to bring it back, when I was in high school, um, it, it was very, it was very, um, I was, I was sort of stratified to taking remedial classes because for some reason uh, back in the day, they, they would think that because if you spoke Spanish at home, they would right away put you in ESL classes. And so these extra remedial classes would prevent me from taking AP or honors classes. And usually what one thing in common was like a lot of minority kids were in these classes. And so when you're in these type of classes, you don't really get the type of uh, training and sort of that you know that you face when you go to college and you take a science course and you're like oh my goodness this like you don't you're not really prepared to but luckily I was part of this equal opportunity program which was for um, for Hispanics Black Native American where they provided um, different resources like studying resources and also um, monetary uh, resources like if you needed textbooks for first generation students from uh, lower socioeconomic class and 
the good thing about this program that supported me actually they make sure that you make sure that, that you graduate because it's part of this um, back then was part of the federal Pell grant um, and another story I'll tell you about this um, how I ended up at Ryder was that I, I always wanted to go to college. I just didn't know what that constituted. And by, back then, when I was applying in 1998, we didn't really have the internet uh, to go and, and search about different schools. We were really subjected to our guidance counselor to giving us these packages and then we had to fill them out. And my guidance counselor in high school, she was very keen on like, well, Caroline, you know, maybe you should go to vocational school. And I was just like, no, I really want to go to college. And she's like, yeah, but I don't want to, you know, it's very difficult and it might be, you know, and it's expensive. So luckily I, I was, you know, inducted into this program and it really helped me, um, you know, do well. I mean, when I got to college, it was a big, it was a huge culture shock. Um, I didn't know the, I had to study or the rigor of science, but this, this program eventually helped me uh, graduate. So once I graduated from Ryder, I came home and I remember uh, my dad telling me like, okay, now that you graduated, you have to go find a job. You know, you can't just sleep all day. <laughs> so I picked up the New York Times and I found, um, I, and I found a help wanted ad and it said, cause I was like, what do I do with a science degree? And I remember I saw in the help wanted, I said, you know, if for, if you're a biology major, and you have some PCR experience. And I remember doing PCR in lab, but I, I, didn't, I didn't have the, I mean, now I know that I wasn't really experienced. So back then I was like, oh yeah, I have a bunch of experience. So anyways, I went to an, an interview with Dr. Moria Suji, who at the time was at NYU School of Medicine in our diamond, and he was working on vaccine development. And he was looking for a technician who would dissect salivary glands from mosquitoes. So, you know, I remember, you know, I was so scared of my dad kicking me out that I went into that interview and I was like, yes, I can do everything. Tell me what, and I go in the next day and be like, oh my goodness, what do I get myself into? But luckily I found other technicians that helped train me and, into dissecting and learning sort of the ropes of how, how to, you know, navigate this high, like sort of high standard lab. Um, and then, so once Dr. Suji's uh, projects kept, for, you know, uh, finishing like some of his grants, and I saw that there was a gap in between. I asked him, I said, Dr. Suji, you know, this is uh, something that, um, you know, can I, can I, would it be okay if I were to go, you know, and use more of what I study, which is biopsychology and, you know, apply to other labs. And so I did, and I, uh, so yeah, so this was with, um, with Dr. Suji. So afterwards, I just wanted to show that I worked on a few projects where I was acknowledged in, the, in, the, in their papers. And then I applied to that job at Columbia. And luckily this, this, uh, this group was meeting a stereologist. And a stereologist is just a person who looks at post-mortem brain tissue and you're trained to count the neurons and also uh, measure the cell volume. And so this group, um, what was really interesting in particular was that they were looking at suicide post-mortem brains. So I was really, you know, and this is something I didn't even know even existed, but I, I was lucky to, to join this group because of, um, you know, because of what happened to my sister. So I was really interested in learning more about this. And so at, 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 at Columbia, I was able to, um, to contribute to many manuscripts and also in different, in different grants and also posters. And everyone here, I remember because I was more interested in neuro, so I would be more um, inclined into like listening in and conversations. And everyone spoke about uh, in this department about this meeting called the Society for Neuroscience. And the Society for Neuroscience, for me, when, when you hear, when I heard about it, I was like, wow, this is great. You know, you hear about all these different scientists and different, like all kinds of uh, work related, brain related work that, that is going on all over the world. And so this, this was a meeting that I, you know, I, I had a lot of, um, I was just really intrigued by it. And I remember going up to my boss and telling her like, listen, I want to go to the Society for Neuroscience. I think it'd be good for me to be a good exposure. So she said to me, sure, you can go as long as you take the time off, pay your way and pay um, for your membership. And she's like, and you have to submit an abstract. So at the time I was working on um, counting some uh, post-mortem brain of um, actually of, uh, of, of primates. 
And so that we saw some differences. And so that I was able then to write up a, this abstract and submit it. And so this submission allowed me to, to attend the meeting. And on my way to the meeting, I was in, uh, I was in Newark. I took a plane uh, to San Diego and I met uh, Dr. Nicholas Ngoli. He actually sat right next to me and the whole ride there, um, I didn't even know he was the senior associate dean at the time, but the whole ride there, we were talking about science and I was telling him the ideas I had and sort of what I wanted to do if I were to have my own lab. And so when we were on the plane, one of the, you know, he had asked me, he's like, what about going to graduate school? And I was like, what do you mean going to graduate school? I don't, I, I can't go to graduate school. I just finished college and I'm like, you know, I mean, so many loans. And also I, you know, I just spent all my money on this trip and, and this meeting. And he's like, no, no, no. He's like, you get paid to go to graduate school. You get a stipend of 29,000 you know, plus you get health insurance. And, and I was just like, are you serious? How come no one ever told me about this? And he's like, no, no, that, that's how it is. So, um, so I actually didn't even believe him. So I just said to him, you know what? I, I remember saying this to my mom and she's like, well, just try, just apply. And I, so I only applied her to Rutgers, um, to, to Rutgers uh, at the time was New Jersey Medical School. And so I, because I, I did not believe him, honestly, I just was like, okay, let me just apply. And luckily I, I got in, I got in with honors um, and also in, in also with the, the Sloan um, um, P, P Alpha, um, the Alpha P Sloan grant really, it, these, both of these uh, helped me a lot monetarily because they provided me with a laptop and also um, with a lot of autonomy of what I wanted to do as far as my research laboratory rotations. I didn't have to be so subjected to just one mentor. Um, this provided me more with like an advisory team um, where like the school is more in charge of how, you know, how independent do you, do you want to be? And so when for my PhD, what I did was I did a rotation in a gut lab and also um, in a dopamine receptor lab. And so I wasn't really interested in just doing work on the gut or in the brain. And at the time, the brain gut axis was still very new, but it was really intriguing to me because um, there's a lot of psychotropic drugs that are targeted um, for emotional parts, uh, for, different, for different psychiatric diseases that actually have a metabolic side effect. And so that, I always found that very interesting. And so one of the questions I asked was, and I, and I found through all this background research of doing the laboratory rotations was that the gut actually has a lot of dopamine receptors and so serotonin receptors, not just in, in the brain. And so that I wanted to, so one of the questions I asked was like, well, what if the, the drugs are also hitting these receptors that are expressed there and modulating nutrient absorption? You know, could that be exacerbating um, some of the, the diets that we see um, in today in humans? And so this, uh, I, you know, I, I wrote this proposal up and I uh, sent it to NIH and I was given this really prestigious um, dissertation award, which allowed me to come up, you know, allowed me to pay for my own project and, and finish my PhD and pay for my, uh, for my mice and my supplies. Um, and it showed me how to budget, you know, um, with a grant and also how to be more independent and more self-autonomy with, with, with this kind of, um, with, with this prestige. So, and it also allowed me to understand the frustrations of working with mice and how long it takes to, you know, and how many variables are into play. So knowing this, I, I figured that for my, um, for my postdoc, I didn't want to work with mice because of all the different variables I saw and also the cost was very high. So I wanted to, for my postdoctoral experience, I wanted to study a very small and simple system which is why I started working with the Drosophila model system. And I asked Ed if it was okay if I, if, if I joined his lab. And he said, yeah, sure, I have a position open for you. And he's like, but I do, because you don't have any Drosophila experience, I do recommend you apply the Cold Spring Harbor course. He's like, it's very competitive to give in, but if once you're in, you know, it's really great way to learn about a new system. Um, and luckily I did, I, you know, this is where I met Dr. Kang. We, Luckily we were, I, I was accepted to this course and within those three weeks, it was like a really uh, intense crash course of learning a whole new model system, as well as, you know, learning the different, uh, who are the leaders in the field and you get to interact with them and ask, uh, you know, questions and also get to 
um, spend time with them socially. So it really is a good way to get introduced to, to a new field. And so um, one of, you know, through this postdoctoral research experience, one of the, um, I think, very important to have for anyone is to have your own, build your own community. Um, so this is uh, Isla, she's right now uh, finishing up. She's a PhD candidate student at, at Harvard. And this is Dr. Ivan Santiago. And so I'm sharing this picture because they were a huge support um, network for me. It, it was a really great way for me to have to have um, sort of this audience where I would present my, my research lab uh, work to them before I would even present it to Ed and just get that, um, you know, like that, that feedback, the constructive feedback and also the support that I needed and just to be comfortable with the language. And so that when I do go on and present in front of my, my department, I can have more, you know, a sense of confidence and, and be more, you know, obviously practice and things like that. But I think um, they, they show a lot, they share a lot of experiences um, with me because, um, so Isla was born in, in Mexico and, and Ivan is from, from Puerto Rico. So we do share a lot of similarities in, in that sense where we feel like a lot of imposter syndrome. So having a support team that um, that also understands you and, and can, you know, sort of personalize a lot of different experiences with you is really important to have that in science because it, you do get um, sort of mixed up into thinking that maybe this is not for me, you know, if you get frustrated, but, but that's not true. And so um, one of the reasons why I started studying aggression is because aggression is, um, is a behavior that you can readily recognize it, right? As it, in, in the fight, this fighting behavior, as you can see it here in the tigers, the monkeys, the mice and the flies. And like, while it's obvious to everyone looking at these pictures that these this is aggressive behavior, what you'd be surprised to find out is like, these are all females. And aggression um, has been studied in males dating back to the 1900s, but female aggression has been largely ignored. But despite this history being largely overlooked, as you can see, Female aggression is pervasive uh, across species. And there's this pattern of female aggression that is similar across species that's very robust. It's quantifiable and it's reproducible. So yet these pathways, the neural pathways that govern this circuit still needs to be determined. So they, this was, there was a lot of opportunity for me to ask questions um, as to why, you know, like what is governing uh, this circuit? Now, why should we care about um, studying female aggression? So there is a clear distinction between a functionally relevant aggression, which is used for mating, gathering up sources for food and shelter. And then you have the uncontrolled, the dysregulation of aggression, which is often a common symptom in many psychiatric diseases and neurodegenerative disorders, where there are actual disturbances in the neural circuit that mediate aggression. And rates for women um, with uh, several of these psych many of these psychiatrists are actually significantly higher compared to those for men. And some of these are actually, um, you know, major depressive disorder, anxiety disorder, postpartum psychosis, bipolar disorder. And so there's this aggression against others, and then there's also self-aggression. And although more um, men than women die by suicide, women actually attempt suicide three times more often than men. So there is this. Um, huge, um, you know, uh, uh, information that is available, but no one has has gone and, and looked in, in the basic systems. So, and besides the cognitive symptoms experienced in Alzheimer's, aggression is also an initial symptom. And once it occurs, you know, they're they're commonly it it, become, it persists and it worsens, like to the middle and later stage of the disease until death, and it's so severe that. These patients are commonly fully sedated, so their quality of life is really diminished. And we know dementia is a global problem, um, and it's higher in females. So when we think of therapies, you know, we may propose that it might be different for uh, for women and men, maybe because of hormonal issues, but it's probably also, you know, due to maybe um, likely because of, of genetic issues. So, and I understand, you know, aggression uh, is complex. So there's real benefit to trying to understand it in, in the fly system and what makes the fly system the ideal model um, to study aggression is that, you know, they first they have the complex behavior with far fewer neurons. They also have these conserved genes that are in, present in both human and flies. And we have several transgenic expression systems. And basically it allows you to molecular identify and pinpoint specific cells 
or genes that you, you can infer whether or not they're involved in the behavior. We also have large repositories of fly mutants that are you know, readily available and they're cheap. And now it's a really exciting time to do fly work because now we have the connectome um, where that was generated by Janelia and, and Google. So in half of the, the brain connectome is known where all the neurons and the synapses are traced. And in another year, you know, we'll have the whole uh, brain connectome. So you will know exactly, you know, which neuron is connected to who. And so this really gives you an unprecedented way of getting into the neural circuit that control complex behavior like aggression. Um, and also it's behavior so well characterized that you know what to expect. Um, and it's also stereotypical uh, behaviors. And so, and ultimately, you know, my hypothesis is, is that some aspect um, of this mechanism will be conserved um, in evolution. And when we understand it, you know, we can get to the basic principles for female aggression that can ultimately lead us to translational treatments. And so I'm very um, fortunate in a position because I've ha actually had experience of working with mice um, and, and also now with flies. So in development in Drosophila, um, aggression, it, it involves these, uh, what we call sex stereotypical um, patterns of movement, and that you can quantify by scoring how much of time an animal spends doing a particular pattern, and how much of that pattern then transitions to another pattern. So it enables you to do the statistical analysis of that behavior. Now I'll show you um, some of the patterns that are unique to female fruit flies. So here's a video that was taken at 400 frames per second and slowed down to 10 frames per second. And so you'll see here that the female fly, um, she's walking on her food cup and approaches the opponent. She spreads her rings and headbutts her and then starts with the, the fencing. So these are all um, characterized behaviors that are ultimately all led you know, through, um, through concert uh, of, of neurons and circuits. So, um, you know, let me just show you what this also looks like again, um, because I think it's really important to, to see how the animal, when she walks, so she, as soon as she's approaching, she right away has like this threat, what we call a threat behavior, and by spreading her wings to seem larger, and she headbutts her, the, her opponent and fe head, um, fences in order to push her opponent off the food source. So, and like I was saying before, and what's important to realize is that, you know, the behavior that you just looked at is all specified by genes and circuits. So, and one major unanswered question, like I said before in the field is, you know, what are the nerve cells involved in this female aggression? And so how do you, how do you get to that point? And one way to answer this um, in Drosophila is, we, um, I used a, what we call a binary expression system where you have a GAL4 UAS. And basically the way this tool works is that you, it allows you to target specific cell types to express specific genes. And these could be genes that you are interested in or that you wanna misexpress, or sometimes you know, that you know, they're not normally, where they're not normally expressed, you can knock them down. Or you can introduce like an inducible uh, protein in nerve cells and, and um, cause um, like cell activation. And maybe some of your interests are familiar with optogenetics. So it's very similar except it's a thermogenetic approach where we use this temperature sensitive um, cation channel to talk the, the neuronal activity where, um, so if once you turn on the heat, it allows for um, the cation channel to open and allow depolarization and, and activation of, 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 of the cell. And so there are all these different hundreds of GAL4 drivers that are expressed in various uh, um, cell types. And so you're able to then uh, go ahead and activate, let's say, so these are just like, they have like libraries and libraries of these, and they're not um, meant to be, they're just randomly expressed, but it allows you to activate those uh, random neurons. And then you can observe the fly for, and look at the, if any changes in, in, in the behavior and to see, you know, do I see female aggression? And so first, before I uh, want to show you what I, I found um, of the female aggression of the line that I found, I want to show you first what wild type fights look like. So here is um, a video of two female fr fruit flies that are wild type females. Um, you'll see that they are uh, what we call like this low posture fencing 
um, like, you know, some headbutts and some pushing. Um, but most of the time in, in female fruit flies, you, you see this common um, result in the sharing of the resources, you know, and they, they don't really establish this dominant behavior. And now here you see um, R2601, when it activated those neurons, you see that the females are now, um, you know, have these um, high posture fencing, this that you saw before, like the wings up. And so they're constantly going back and forth. And here is also the female is no longer sharing her food source. And that was all done by me activating, um, you know, a, a group, uh, clusters of neurons and to see this behavior. Um, so I'll show you where um, in this, okay. And I'll show you what I saw. So underneath, um, so one of the things I asked was like, okay, I found the behavior. Now, what does the brain look like? And so what we saw was the GAL4 driver was expressed in all of these uh, and, and the, this, the green fluorescent uh, reporter gene in thousands of these potential neurons. So we had to do um, one more rigorous step to find out, um, you know, is it, are all these neurons, you know, are all these cells um, important or are there a subset of cells that are important? And so, and knowing from Ed's work from, from my lab, we know that there's, they've, they've uh, narrowed it down to single cell um, serotonin neurons that are responsible for male aggression. So I hypothesize that there, there'd be some, some subset in this, um, this population to be responsible also um, for the female aggression. So um, what we did was we used the GAL4 line that displayed the female aggression, but this time I use a um, inter intersectional strategy. Um, it's a similar system with the using pre-log system. And so we modified it, um, the GAL4 trip A1, so that we can manipulate it by crossing it um, to like different, what we call 200 different flip lines. And basically uh, what happens is to further, you know, reduce this population, what happens is that the enzyme, um, once that you have the two populations between the GAL4, the US trip, um, and the flip lines, they're both co-localized, you see they, it gets excised, the, the enzyme excises and allows for trip A1 activation only in these subset of cells. And so you have this reduced neuronal population and female aggression and uh, phenotype. So you can then ask, okay, you know, was I, even though I um, further reduced the number of cells, do I still see um, preserve the phenotype? And so here's the original pattern I had shown you before. And then after crossing it to several, uh, to 200 flip lines, actually, there were three flip lines that gave us a positive uh, hit. And so here's the, one of the flip lines. It still shows a robust number of, of, of cells that the GAL4 is expressed in. And so does these um, 383. And so basically, so here's the MIC. I'm sorry, I just, I should explain. So this is the MIC. This is just a staining of where the GAL4, this is just to highlight where the GAL4 driver um, is uh, expressed. And so what I saw was that in these different, it's much more reduced than the original pattern, um, but it wasn't reduced enough to, to what um, I thought, you know, we could possibly like a much, much more restrictive subtype. So what we did was um, I found that, you know, with actually with Bun in the lab, what we saw was that in this one flip line, there was, um, there was this persistence where of these cluster of neurons that were present um, in the posterior uh, side of the brain that were not actually, I didn't see them uh, also um, in, in the male brain. So I figured, okay, so since the, the males don't have this, uh, this phenotype, you know, could this cluster of neurons be responsible uh, for, for the behavior? And also because the same cluster of neurons actually has been implicated in other um, types of behavior, like uh, they, what would they call it, like female receptivity, so it would have been, you know, so one, so, so we hypothesized that perhaps this cluster of neurons would be responsible for that female aggression. And so we were able to then um, narrow it down because we knew these were double sex cells and we were able to narrow down with a double sex flip uh, to four neurons. And you can see that they're expressed. So here um, you're looking at a confocal C-stack images of the female and the male brain. And the purple stain that you're looking at here is just the uh, anybody that visualizes the synapses. And, and so what my work found was here, these four, uh, like you see here, four female specific labeled a green 
that also express this female isoform of a gene that controls sex determination, that when you activate these cells, you see um, a female aggression. And so this was very cool, you know, and it happened to it, that these PC1 alpha neurons that are expressed in females and not in males, that when I activate them, I see female aggression. And I'm gonna show you what I mean by that. So here it is. So here is um, a video of um, females at 20 degrees when the trip A1 is not acting, but once I raise the heat and allow for depolarization and activation of, of those neurons, you see the increase in female patterns uh, of aggression. And then I went on to quantify the behavior and we found no difference in the number of head butts at, you know, at 20 degrees between the wild type fights and the, the trip A1, the mutant flies. But yet when we raise the temperature, Right, you see this, you see at 29 degrees, the number of headbutts um, from the mutant flies is sig much more significantly higher. So next, you know, we wanted to uh, confirm and find out, okay, so what is the identity of these neurons? Um, and so looking at the different uh, uh, classical neurotransmitters, I didn't see any co-localization um, through this immunolabeling. And so I was able to find, so here uh, is another confocal Z stack images, and this is what we call co-localization. So here is an MC, MCDA, this at a higher magnification at like a 60X um, objective of an anti-MCDA, which is a GFP marker, and it just labels um, the, the cell membrane. And using these antibodies then against also, this is the red antibody, it uses against the choline um, acetyl astro, uh, astrose transferase that is labeled here in red. And when you, you're, when you overlap them together, you see that they're both merged, suggesting that it's, it's, it's co-localized there. So then this showed that these are indeed uh, cholinergic neurons that are responsible for this female aggression. So now, um, you know, we have this super cool phenotype that pinpointed to a very robust behavior in females and not in males that are cholinergic and are sex specific. Now for the next, uh, my independent phase of, of my career, one of the questions we're gonna ask is, okay, what are the presynaptic partners and what are the postsynaptic partners? So basically what is part, um, what is driving the circuit and what is the output um, of this circuit? And can we, you know, can we manipulate this um, in a way that you can either inhibit or activate in different ways? You can do it pharmacologically or you can do it um, through um, different ways of, like I showed you before, through thermogenetic um, activation or even through optogenetics and just getting at a way of how this whole circuit works. And also the other endeavor that I'm gonna do as in my independent project is to see like what happens when the circuit undergoes disease like in your, um, degenerative diseases. So it really is um, a really great way of getting down to the, neuro, to, to the neural circuit and learning the fundamentals of how, how this works. And another you know, interesting would be whether or not these downstream neurons, you know, is it also found in the male, um, aggression circuit or is it completely sexually dimorphic meaning is it com you know is it different for males and females completely or do it, does the circuit merge at one point in the area of the brain where it's both male and female so these are just these are some of the questions that that I'm going to ask in in my research uh, lab and so um, but finally I just want to thank um, you know obviously my family um, for you know for helping me through this whole scientific journey, but also um, Ed, um, Ed for being such a great mentor, Bun, uh, Rachel and Sahaley for the Kravitz Lab. Um, also my program officer who's been amazing, um, you know, with the K99, the Mosaic Grant has really landed me uh, on this platform that has been really great for my work in getting a lot of attention. And also my K99 advisory committee, I definitely would not be where I am right now if it weren't for Mike Greenberg or Ross Siegel or Rachel Wilson or Ben. Um, and I'm, I'm really appreciative of them. And then now I've been working a lot with Kerry Ressler and Bill um, and my, again, my Mosaic mentors um, that part of the Mosaic grant, which is the K99 independence grant, and you have outside uh, mentors, which is Mary Munson, my boys and Ashanti Edwards. So the American uh, Society for Cell Biology has been really um, instrumental 
with my mentoring now that I'm, transi I'm transitioning to faculty positions. Um, and Avi, who's at Brandeis, has been really helpful with that. And so has Erica Paulsberg. She's um, over at UPenn. Um, and of course, um, Isla and Lisa and Lauren and Ivan. Um, and also want to thank my the Flyery agents and where, you know, the Bloomington Stock Center and also Claire for giving me uh, those different, those, uh, all the, um, the Janelia Gal four lines and my current funding. And that's it. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Maggio. That was very interesting talk. And also you know, your trajectory to the research now has been very impressive. So I have a question uh, for you before the uh, audience put in a question. So you have basically found this phenomena, this, this set of neurons, right, that are unique to females. Um, Aggression, but males do not have them. Like, how common is that? Like, to have such a difference between male and the females? Like, do they also yes. exhibit other type of behaviors? Yes, that's a really great question, um, and that's something that I'm actually looking at now. And so, there is some, you know, like for example, um, there there seems to be in the literature that aggression seems to be sexually dimorphic. And there may be an other like mating and courtship behavior as well. Um, but in other areas of behavior like feeding and, and, and um, like let's say locomotion, I haven't seen anything yet where there's a sexually dimorphic circuit. Um, so that would be really interesting to look at. But yes, I, I agree. I think that, you know, is, is this something that is only for aggression and, and you know, or in courtship, or is there um, other behaviors that are also, you can see the the the, the, the difference, I mean, the separate uh, circuits for the behavior. So yeah, that, that's a great question. Okay, so we, we have a question from the student uh, here, and she actually asked a similar question I just uh, did. Why is that it only affects female flies? Right. And um, so and there is another question. Um, so I, she was wondering what kind of information they were getting at the psychiatric institute by counting the neurons of the postmortem brain <laughs> and suicide victims. <laughs> That's a great one. <laughs> That's a great one. So, OK, so I'll first the first question is, um, you know, so those PC1 cells that are found in just in the females, there's actually um, a, a male form of them that we call P1 cells that another group found. Um, and so they, you know, and it's around the same area, uh, like anatomically in, in the fly brain. Um, so, and they seem to be just male specific and the PC1 seems to be a uh, female specific. So it's not just that they're present, like it's like an added thing for the females, but it seems that the males also have, it's just they, they uh, it's anatomically close, but the males also have a distinct cells in that same region that when you activate them, you see this, um, this uh, male aggression phenotype. And so for, okay, and so and also counting the neurons, so that's really interesting. So what happens is um, these research groups, they have postmortem brain tissue from, from human postmortem. And what they do is they stain with the antibody staining for either serotonin or uh, dopamine or acetylcholine or any of the classical neurotransmitter or peptides. They, they do a lot of immunolabeling. And so they look at the different areas, um, the cytoarchitecture of, of the different areas of like they say, maybe the prefrontal cortex. And they look at, you know, like how, how many neurons are stained, like how many of those reflect like dopamine or maybe a, like they want to look at receptors or, and also, you know, do the neuron size or like the cells um, neuronally, do they have a bigger soma, a larger soma compared to the other ones? So it, do, it does provide a lot of information. If you're comparing, let's say, um, from suicide and non-suicide patients, you know, is there differences in expression of serotonin or dopamine? Um, and also the number of neurons, you know, is there, so what one of the things they found was that in the dorsal raphlate nucleus, which is 
down by the brainstem. They found like a, a robust number of serotonin neurons where they found fewer in the prefrontal cortex. So one they can infer as to like, they, could there be some type of um, like, uh, you know, some type of mismatch or something going on during the, you know, through, through this. So it does provide, I mean, it's limited information, but it does provide with, with information. So yeah, that, that's a good question though. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, and we actually have like four questions, but they're very similar. Um, so really interested in this sex dimorphism, right? And it's uh, you have shown that in the fruit flies. So they wonder whether they also exist in other animal models. And if there is, what would be the evolutionary advantage of female aggressions? Oh, that's a great question. Okay, so... Um... They they do have so in mice, um, the re, the way so one interesting insight into so I'll I'll be honest when I first started this work Ed my boss did not think that females would would there would be different cells there would be sexual dimorphism he just thought you know the this is the circuit that's why we should focus on males we don't need to focus on females but I was like no but I, okay so I want to prove that though that it is the same and so when we came to this PC one story. It was, it was really interesting to see the PC1, the P1. So it gave that sexual dimorphism. And then, so one of the things I think was obvious too, was that I showed you before the stereotypical patterns of behavior, they're sex specific. So that's another indication that there, there are differences there in the circuit. Um, for ma mammalian systems, from what I'm hearing is that it is different for female mice and male mice. Um, but that literature, I haven't been so, you know, I, I still, I think there's still like an ongoing um, studies, but, but I, th I think they have somewhat of, you know, some depiction of some type of sexual dimorphism in, in, in aggression for, for mice. Um, now, as far as being relevant to evolution, so one thing that I think is interesting is you know, a lot of the psychiatric, I mean, this is just going off. This is really big, big, big picture going off on, on tangents here. But a lot of the psychiatric drugs, they, you know, they're, it's not gender specific or anything. It's just, it's all for everyone. And I think that once we understand how sexual dimorphism works, we can, you know, it, it'd be just better for treatment, uh, better for also for behavior modification. Um, it's just that for a long time that people were studying males and, and ignoring females, but now the NIH mandates that all researchers also include females, which is very important. Um, and I think that that will eventually translate, you know, this understanding that there are different sexual, that there's sexual dimorphism in the circuit, understanding how to approach that as I think as a medicinal point, as a, farm, as a treatment point is very important. Um, as, as it would have the effects of how it would, you know, let's say affect a male versus a female. So that, that's where, you know. <laughs> it's, it's just really cool, right? To have the, whatever comes out of Drosophila, the same similar patterns or the information that we can apply that to higher organisms like humans. Yes, definitely. So I have a, so I have some, a question from about your graduate school. Can you elaborate on your experience as a graduate student in terms of balancing your personal life and studying? Oh, my goodness. So that's a great question. Um, it was tough. Um, so when I started graduate school, I was I had my son. He was eight months. He was Ethan was around nine months, eight months old. So it, it, it was a, a huge endeavor. But luckily, um, what I did, like I told you before, when my family is not just my mom, my dad, it's my family is like everybody, cousins, aunts. So I was really fortunate that once I started this huge endeavor, my family was very supportive. And so they helped me, they helped a ton with my son and so did my in-laws. Um, and they were just, you know, even if they would be at home, they would take Ethan and I would just study um, because they knew that, you know, my success was going to be his success and that, you know, kids learn by, um, you know, by, by, by having role models. And so it was really important. So my degree is actually not just for me, it's like for my whole entire family. So it, it really was like a big, it's like it took some village sort of. And I think balancing my, my you know, um, like school and, and home was something that maybe a lot, it wouldn't work for a lot of people, but I actually intertwined both of them. 
um, where, <laughs> so my son was eight months old and to put him to sleep, I would actually read him some of my journal club papers <laughs> and it actually would help ease him fall asleep. So it's like you're, you're, you're reading to your child but at the same time doing your homework. So that, that's what I try to do. Another thing I also did was I brought Ethan um, sometimes to the student lounge where I would run experiments. Um, so I try to not separate them. Um, I try to just, I, I would mix both of them up and then I would like, or in a sense, like, you know, I would bring my family there. I would also even bring my mom. If I'd say, okay, mom, can you watch him? Or, um, well, you know, while I go and do experiments, can, you know, can you do this? Or can, and I think like having them see me in the lab and how much time and, and, and energy I need to, to, to um, sort of partake in order for me to be successful was really important for, for me, for them to see. And also for them to sort of share my stress, um, what was, yeah, what was important. Um, but it's, it is very hard though. Um, I'm not gonna lie, having a child and then, but it's doable. Um, I did it, you know, uh, through a miracle, but <laughs> I did it, no. And it was funny because when my son was in daycare, when I would pick him up, his uh, people, like his teachers would tell me like, your son keeps telling us that you're gonna go feed the, they're gonna go feed the mice. And I was like, what? Because uh, so when I was doing the antipsychotic study, I would put the medication in uh, these peanut butter pellets and you had to dose the mice twice a day. So I would always tell Ethan, like, okay, Ethan, I'm going to leave you. I'm going to go feed the mice and I'll come back for you. He'd be like, my mommy going to feed the mice. My mommy going to feed the mice. So um, I think having him grow around, grow up around that, you know, sort of environment was, was, was cool. Even though, you know, I didn't, you know, sometimes you feel like the mom guilt of not spending so much time with him. But I think that, like I said, I think kids, you know, learn by role models and having that type of role model around um, is really impactful for them. And so they, you know, so they see like, okay, you know, you work hard, this is what you get. Um, and so when I graduated um, from Rutgers, my entire family went. So it, it was it was hard because they only limit you to two tickets, but I have to tell you, they, I don't even know what they did to those ushers at, at the stadium, but I, they all went in. I don't know how they got, they must've either told them look the other way, but, um, and, and it was because it was monumental because, you know, for me to get this piece is huge. Um, and my grandmother was there. It's, it's her degree. It's my aunt's degree. It's my uncle's degree. So it's more of a, like this huge, um, so I, I, yeah, so that, that's how it was. I really, I think I mixed both of them, you know, my, my family and, and my work together. I just would tell them everything. I would tell them like, listen, this is, because sometimes it's like not, it, it's not that they don't know anything about science, but honestly, a lot of the stuff that we encounter in science, is that you can easily translate and they, you, you'd be surprised the, the type of um, insight that they can provide or sort of like an objective view and information they can give you that you're just like, oh yeah, actually that does make sense. Um, so that that was important for me. Well, first I really love the tip about reading scientific papers to uh, young children to put into sleep. <laughs> I wish I knew that. That's pretty cool. And I and I thought I think you also very eloquently right made arguments how you can turn your family as a very good supportive system, not just in life but also part of your work as well. So. The, that, that's brilliant. Thank you for that. We actually have quite a few questions, but I also noticed our time uh, has got to the end of this public session. So we have a, a student only uh, session following this. So we can just continue uh, these questions, uh, addressing them in that session. So if I can ask um, all the faculty uh, members who are here, and this will be a good time for you uh, to leave. And uh, before you leave, and uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Maggio again for giving us this wonderful talk. Uh, if you're a student, uh, please feel free to stay and ask her any questions uh, you wish. So this will be a very informal session, right? Uh, feel free to you know talk to her, and uh, you know we can start with some of the questions in the in the Q A and session. Can you see them yourself, Caroline? Oh. Um... Let me check. Yes, some. Yes, yes. Some okay. Of, sorry, guys. I was like so focused. <laughs> no, no, okay. you're good. I, I thought since this is an informal session, I'll let this to be more like a conversation between you and the student. Oh, so yeah, be good if you can just go over this and then try to address that, and I'll just stay in the background while you do so. Okay. Sure. Sure. Of course.
Okay, so let me see. Let's see. Okay, so how is it? Um, what are some of the adversaries you had to overcome being a minority in STEM? Oh, they, there was, um, I think many of the ever is, is sort of, um, you don't see or, or you don't meet that many people. For example, I, I never, while I was in grad school, I didn't meet any um, Latina scientists or Latina professors. So I think that, you know, explaining your family dynamic and also how important your family is to you and your image and your culture, um, that, that was challenging for me to, because you always feel like you have to teach them about everything. Whereas as the, you know, where you already know like everything about the American culture, right? And you, and you learn, but now you have to like teach them also about your culture. So I think that that was hard. And also um, times when people didn't understand like, okay, well, why do you have to make the appointments for your parents? Why do you have to be the one, um, you know, sort of arguing with people about their bills and, and making the, you know, these medical arrangements. And I'm like, because you don't know my family dynamic. They rely on me for a lot of things. Um, and so that, and I felt like that, that was hard. I think um, knowing your fa family responsibility and also living in a multi-generational uh, house is, could be challenging too. Um, whereas like, like I said, if, you know, you have your parents, if you take them to a doctor's off to a doctor's visit, and these are just responsibilities you have, especially if you live with them that a lot of other people don't understand. They're usually uh, you know, postdocs or sometimes professors that really just focus on the work and don't have, like, th there's not really that family uh, dynamic. And I think that just emphasizing that and just telling them the importance of what family is to me um, was, was a bit challenging sometimes. Um, the other thing I think that was hard was a lot of times that we have this imposter syndrome um, that I, you know, you feel that, okay, so is it, you know, because, you know, you're like, are you Latina or is it, you know, because I'm black? Is it, what, what is it that, you know, like I don't see other people that, and then so maybe because I don't see other people that I don't think that this may be possible for me. So that I think is, is a huge factor in that sense. Um, the other uh, minority adversity, I think, um, was the fact that many of our, my friends um, that are also minorities, we were, a lot of us were in remedial classes, even like in high school. So a lot of us didn't have like the proper tools and trajectories to have for college. So a lot of us like got like 2.0s or, or during, during college. And it was mostly because we had to catch up so much. And I think that um, that was like one experience uh, that I had and also a lot of times you, you don't have professors that take you under your, their wing because they probably either, I don't know if it's because you're so different than them or they can't relate to you. But I always find that um, between our community, we all mentor each other. And that has really helped me move forward. And I think that my differences and my other resilience and adversity is my superpower. It's what makes me different than other researchers. It allows me to see things in, more, uh, in, in a different way. And I think it allows me to be more creative in my work. Um, but yeah, and I think now with um, a lot of different, um, in different ways of, of promoting DEI is really putting us on the platform. And I think that's important to still own up to your identity and really you know, teach others about your culture and about what's important to you you know, what are some microaggressions that they may say that you don't approve of? I think letting them know is very important and not having that sort of resentment, you know, to that person, because that could, that could impair, that could, um, you know, sort of stop, you know, you moving forward in your career. Because a lot of times, a lot of these acceptances to graduate school, to great jobs is through these recommendation letters from, from professors. So it's really important that you do have a transparent and your relationship with them because those do dictate a lot of where you end up. So I, th I think that that was you know one of the the key quite the key um, things that I find that, that are really important is to to make sure that you have you know as many mentors as you can and also that I think people want to understand our culture or, or differences 
and don't be afraid to be yourself in lab. Like sometimes I'll play Biggie or play, you know, Tupac or play um, sometimes different R&B or even salsa and merengue. Um, and just because that's who I am, that's what I play. I'm not, you know, I don't know if they're expecting me to play classical music, but that's not how I focus. So I'm, I'm not, I think, don't be afraid to be yourself in the lab, you know, that's it. Okay, and then the other ones. Yeah, you can, can scroll amount, up and down, yeah. Okay, can the amount of neurons um, unique to females differ among females? Oh, okay, yeah, that's a good question. Um, that we're still, I'm trying to figure out, you know, if, it, because I'll tell you one thing. So when I did this study, there were some, some, some of the brains actually had two neurons and some had four neurons. So whether or not, you know, the, it's just two or four, I think it, it varies. Um, but, so that's another thing too with, with, with brains and, and even with human postmortem brain tissue is that you have a map, but that's just more of, um, like a suggestion, like a sort of a, give you a clue as to where it is, but that doesn't necessarily reflect what exactly it looks like um, anatomically. You know, it's not just one prototype. Like, it, you know, like for example, we all look very different. That's the same, you know, inside of architect, like the side architecture of our cells as well. So there, there, there may be a variation, but whether or not there's one or two that, that still remains to be determined. Um, okay, let me see what else. Oh my goodness, the language barrier between the parents. Oh my, it was horrible. My, my, uh, so for, <laughs> for parent-teacher conference, like the difference in the language barrier in school was hard, it was hard because um, my mom doesn't, like my, my dad and my mom don't understand like a lot of the American culture. So me teach, telling them like, what's appropriate to do to my, like, don't hug and kiss my teacher. Like, you can't do that. You know, these are the type of things I had to like teach them about, but that's more of a cultural thing. But the language barrier is not being able to advocate for yourself. For example, I was put in these remedial classes like in um, ESL when I didn't even need to be in. Um, and so I think that having an adult who spoke English and advocated for me would have been the ideal, um, the ideal situation, but I didn't have that. And then when I explained to my parents, they're like, well, what's the big deal? You're doing well in those classes. And I'm like, no, because they're, part, they're taking away from me doing you know, AP or honors or other things that open up my schedule. So I, I think that, that, that was hard. And also when you know, you're at the DMV or any of these government agencies and you're there with your parent and you're translating, I think that that, and you have to translate like really tough um, sort of, you know, like these phrases that you're just like, okay, there's no words of, for this in Spanish, uh, but, the, but yeah, it, it, but you manage, you manage and I think you get used to it. Um, but yeah, I think like you, you just adapt <laughs> and you learn to speak Spanglish. So, but that's, that's how it was. Um, what other researchers and studies inspires you? Um, the researchers that that really so, so there's a lot of researchers now that um, really inspire me. Like there's uh, Dr. Sabur Ishmael. He's over at uh, Columbia University and he looks at pain. Um, the other person would be this one. Um, I think it's Co Coffee, his first name. But he's he's really inspirational because he he's a psychiatrist and MD PhD and he looks at um, he, he looks at the brain and in, in the psychiatric and he looks at it very in a different unique angle and so that I find very inspiring the other person would be Dr. Q who's also a student of Dr. of, of my boss of Ed Kravitz and Dr. Q was actually illegal um, and he came from from Mexico and he was able to like work from the farms and, and you know working with his family all the way to Harvard Medical School and now he's a neurosurgeon I think at John Hopkins He's very inspirational um, just to know that, you know, he comes very similar, similar roots and ended up where he, he is. So that, that's, that's really inspirational. Um, let me see what else. Sorry, guys, I am not good at this stuff. Okay. Considering the things you know about. Oh, yes. I am definitely going to look at the different genes. So that, that's another huge part of my project is to see whether or not, remember how I told you, so the P1 neurons are what are responsible for male aggression, the PC1 for female. 
So one of the other projects, part of my K99 grant is to look at um, the different, uh, the, the, the genetic profiling of both these cells, like what makes them different? You know, is there any differences? And do any of those genes, have they been implicated in humans and how conserved are they? So those are the, those are what we're, what we're looking at. But yes, that's super important. Why do you choose um, for your research? Um, it can be any mono. Oh, that's a good question. So the reason why I do work with with flies um, for this is because they have 150,000 neurons compared to the human brain that has a billion or a million, whatever you know. Yeah, billion neurons. And so you have when you have more neurons and more you dealing with different variables, more complexities, whereas with the fly brain, it's more about, it's not so much as translate, it's more about the fundamentals and how everything is working. So in neurons, you have the excitatory and inhibitory, like how do they both talk to each other? How do the peptides are, and you know, how, how does this involve with the peptides and the different classical neurotransmitters? How does this all come into, you know, into circuit, what we call it, to circuit or concert into circuit? And how does it all, um, you know, how does that all work in order to come out with an output of behavior? So those, and what we see is that a lot of these are, you know, for example, they do have neurons just like humans. I mean, humans do, and they also have excitatory and inhibitory. So these are things that are fundamentally conserved. Um, and this is why I look at it because I rather look at a, a, a much simpler brain you're dealing with, um, like I said, less variables and you can sort of um, make more, I, I think more of a, um, gives you more of a clue as to what to look for in the higher, higher systems. But I think that's it. Yeah, I, I think that's all the questions here. Now, if you uh, don't mind, <laughs> can I ask a question on our students' behalf? So uh, you you basically said that you're a strong advocate, right, for supporting the, the STEM students from underrepresented groups. Can you share with us some of the work you have done? Oh, sure. So um, one of the so something that I do is uh, I work with a lot of local schools. Um, so in Boston, there's high schools in Revere and in Lynn that are most students are from, you know, are immigrant kids and first generation um, or minority kids that don't have, you know, like, let's say um, scientists in their family. So one thing that I do is I, I, you know, in these, we recruit high school students to come in and do like a six week um, biomedical, like a, like a program where they are exposed to different researchers and like the different, um, different projects that are out there and that are, that are ongoing and to teach them, like, how does it, how does one, you know, how does, it, how does research get to the news, you know, and how is that even, um, judged? Like what, what are, what are things you can take away and what are things that you should be cautious of? So those are things that we do with, with students. And so they go back home and they teach to their uncle, their aunt, or whatever they learn. So that's been one way of um, getting, you know, at the community level. The other thing would be that um, many times there's like even other minorities that are also postdocs. So we tend to mentor each other. And so we'll call each other on the phone or something, you know, over Zoom and we'll meet and then we'll talk about, okay, what is the new research out? Um, we'll present to each other. And so having that, um, you're just more comfortable. I feel I feel at least more comfortable presenting to them than I would at let's say at you know at like let's say my boss or or something. So I think just having sort of that peer community support is very important. Um, so that's one another way that just keeping all my friends accountable and just having them meet all their goals. But as far as outreach for for kids, that that's one of the things. So like the high school where we have the high school students attend that program and also they have, um, there's another program that I also do with the Journal of Emerging Investigators, where we have high school students that they, any projects, and the, the projects doesn't have to be novel, but they, as long as it has a workable hypothesis, I mean, a, a testable hypothesis, they can publish it in a journal. So this is a journal article that will follow them throughout their careers. And so they don't have, you know, because most of the times when minorities get recommendation letters, they're actually pretty weak. That's been, you know, that that's very common. But at least if they have a publication, even from high school, it's something that could follow them, um, and the work could speak for itself. 
and it's sort of like a, a like uh, documentation of like there. What I always tell my students is try to get your receipts. You know, get docu like get get your publications, get your name out there, start building up your CV. So that's you know, and so this young journal emerging investigator publishes high school students. Um, and the other program is called H Prep, and that's just to expose the six week exposure. Another program that I've also worked in the past um, is having middle school students, like a middle school, uh, for example, like eighth graders come into the lab and we teach them about what, you know, what is going on in the lab and that they too can see themselves as being scientists and that science is not, you know, what they think, at, you know, at school where this is like, oh, this is such a hard subject. Like science can be so many different things of how, how they think and like the different uh, professions that are available to them. So that that's the, those are ways that um, and also whenever I can with my little cousins, you know, and if they have friends or or or, or what um, to to learn more about what what is a scientist, what does that entail? Um, can anyone be a scientist and things like that? So I think uh, th those are ways that I try to reach um, my community. Well, thank you. Uh, there there is one more question uh, that just came in. Uh, considering our time, I think that can be the last questions that, you know, for our session. Uh, can you see it? What he says, how did you feel when you found out that you got on the top? Oh one my God. <laughs> list? That was, yes, that was insane. That was just, um, that, that was really a huge compliment. Um, I, I was really taken, yeah, that, that was, it was really nice to see just because for a long time, I don't, I didn't see myself as a scientist. So seeing the word Latina and then my name underneath was, was, was really emotional for me and my family. That's like, they, you know, they take a lot of pride in that. And so do I. So that, that was, that was awesome to see that. And I'm, I'm really humbled by that and grateful, but I'll tell you one thing. I still don't even think I, I, you know, sometimes I always think like, okay, maybe my my like my my suitcases are still at the door. If anything happens, I'll just. But at least I had a good experience. Like that's still you know something that I, I struggle with is the imposter syndrome. But I think as long as you focus on the science, as long as you focus on your work and what questions you want to ask and the curiosity and your motivation, just focus on that is 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 will lead you um, to to where where you know where you see yourself you want to be eventually. So. <laughs> Well, thank you again, Dr. Maggio, for the wonderful talk and answering all. Thank you for having me. Yes, of course. I'm sure you're pretty tired now and all your <laughs> thirsty because we didn't give you any break uh, for the whole one and a half hours. Uh, so <laughs> everyone, thank you for coming. And this will be end of our webinar. <laughs>